Christian Spirituality in the Catholic Tradition, Part 9. The two most outstanding nuns of this period are St. Hildegard and St. Elizabeth of Schonau. Both were Germans, both were in the Benedictine tradition, and both were highly esteemed mystics. Hildegard, born in 1098, became a Benedictine nun at the age of 18 and became abbess in 1136. She was always ill, and she declared that since the age of three she had had visions, and at the age of forty she was commanded by an interior voice to record her visions. When she consulted St. Bernard about the matter in 1141, he wisely told her to practice the virtues and not pay too much attention to visions and revelations. Hildegard died in 1179, and her revelations were approved by three popes and the Council of Treves. Her writings are a strange mixture of spiritual revelations, the scientific knowledge of her day, and the prophetic intuitions. She left a collection of 300 letters and a principal work entitled Scivius Domini. Always a humble woman in spite of the many calls upon her for advice and her many travels throughout Germany, Hildegard taught a prudent asceticism that enabled her monastery to prosper under her guidance. She provided a surprisingly exact account of her mystical experiences and taught that mystical contemplation is available to all who conquer their vices and allow themselves to be set afire by the Holy Spirit. A good disposition for a contemplative prayer is spiritual reading and then meditating on what has been read. So much better than this is the divine office. St. Elizabeth of Schonau, born in 1129, was also a visionary, but unlike Hildegard, all of her visions were ecstatic and accompanied by extraordinary phenomena and intense suffering. At the command of her confessor, she wrote down her experiences and also composed letters and prayers and books called The Ways of God. Her writings were widely read because she gave spiritual counsel to persons from all states of life. Some critics have theorized that the ways of God is based to a large extent on the Scivias by St. Hildegard, who was a close friend and correspondent. Two other works attributed to Elizabeth are three volumes of visions, although some scholars accept only the first book of Elizabeth's original work, and a treatise on martyrdom of St. Ursula and Companions, which has generally been considered unreliable and the source of many unfounded legends. Neither Hildegard nor Elizabeth have been officially canonized. As regards the emergence of lay brothers, or conversi, in the monastic life, we should note that as early as the 4th century, Pope Syracius had written to the Bishop of Tarragonia, We desire that monks whom seriousness of conduct, holiness of life, and practice of faith commend, be admitted to the duties of the clergy. In 1311, Pope Clement V stated, For the increase of divine worship, we prescribe that monks, at the notification of their abbots, must prepare themselves for all sacred orders, once legitimate excuses have been removed. Finally, Pope Clement VIII decreed, Whoever is received into an order of regulars, much must possess such knowledge of letter or give an unquestioned hope of acquiring such knowledge that he may receive minor orders and in due time the major orders as well, according to the degrees of the sacred council of Trent. <laughs> 
The foregoing statements reflect a gradual transist transition in monastic life, which led not only to the ordination of monks into the priesthood, and consequently the ecclesiastical classification of monastic institutes as clerical right religious, but it also led to a new class of monks called lay brothers. A variety of causes led to this development. By the end of the ninth century the Benedictine monks had devoted themselves almost exclusively to Lectio Divina and liturgical worship, to the detriment of manual labor. The intellectual incompetence and holiness of the monks make them eminently worthy of priestly ordination, while the diocesan clergy of the ninth to the twelfth centuries were often ignorant and immoral. By the eleventh century the monasteries were sorely in need of hands to administer the external goods, do the work of the fields, and perform the domestic duties within the cloister. Numerous monasteries have made use of lay help as laborers and servants, but too often this had led to all kinds of difficulties. The solution was found in the institution of a special class of monks who were distinct from the choir monks. From various documents issued by monasteries of Benedictine life, and from statements made by several popes between the 12th and 16th centuries, we can describe the lay brothers, or conversi, as true religious who form an integral part of the monastic community and are dedicated to the manual labor and external services of a monastery so that the choir monks can dedicate themselves to their particular duties. As their form of life became more clearly defined, the lay brothers pronounced only simple vows, wore a distinctive habit, prayed their own office, assisted at specified monastic exercises, such as conventual mass, compline, chapter of faults, and solemn functions, made an annual retreat, received a week, weekly spiritual conference from their own master or director, and formed a kind of community within the general community of the monastery. Later, when new forms of religious life were approved by the church provision, was usually made for the admission of lay brothers as a distinct but integral part of the religious institute. To summarize, Benedictine spirituality in the 12th century still preserved the essential notes that were common to all monastic spirituality, with certain differences in regard to observances. It was, above all, a spirituality ro firmly rooted in biblical sources and nourished by Lectio Divina and liturgical prayer. The life of the Benedictine monk was a life of prayer and penance, a life withdrawn from the world by a desire to be united with God. As Le Clerc describes it, it was a prophetic life, because it consisted in waiting for the coming of the Lord in prayer and penance. It was an apostolic life, because it was a life of community and love. After the example of the disciplines of the Cenacle and the first Christians, it was a life of martyrdom, because it involved separation from the world and a constant warfare against the obstacles to charity. It was an angelic life, because it sought total detachment through prayer, asceticism, and chastity. It was an evangelical life, because it sought to imitate Christ by walking the way to the gospel. Yet there were also new trends evident in the Benedictine spirituality of the 12th century, thanks to the Cistercian movement. First of all, there was a vigorous insistence on the place of manual labor in monastic life, and this, as we have seen, 
was not so much an innovation as a return to the original teachings of St. Benedict. Secondly, there was an equally strong emphasis on the contempl contemplative purpose of monastic life, with the result that the Cistercians explicitly regulated their Lectio Divina, prayer and ascetic practices, with a view to contemplation and union with God. It is in this second area that the Cistercians made their greatest contribution to spirituality, especially in the persons of St. Bernard and William of St. Thierry, who bring us a step closer to a systematic theology of Christian perfection and a psychology of the mystical state. Chapter 6 Spirituality of the Middle Ages The 12th century was a period of political and ecclesiastical turmoil, intellectual stimulation and challenging adjustment to the changing times. The merchants and artisans of the towers and cities were confronting the ancient feudal system and demanding greater freedom and autonomy as individuals and as me members of the guilds. The Romance languages were slow but surely replacing Latin, and the result that people in a given locality were becoming more isolated culturally and somewhat alienated from the Latin liturgy. The masters in cathedral schools and in monasteries, previously immersed in patristic sources and tradition, were reaching out to new methods of scholarship and thus preparing the way for the rise of the universities. Finally, the laity, individually or in large groups, began to take a more prominent role in the life of the church, even in areas that were formerly considered the exclusive domain of monks and the clergy. Medieval Piety The prologue to the rule of Grandmont, founded by St. Stephen of Muret, stated that there is only one rule of faith and salvation, namely the Gospel. All other rules, such as that of St. Benedict or St. Augustine, are simply applications of the Gospel teaching. The reading and knowledge of the New Testament was not, however, the exclusive prerogative of monks. It was an intense interest in scripture on the part of the laity of the 12th century. In fact, a group of the laity at Metz translated into the vernacular the four Gospels, the letters of St. Paul, and the Psalms. Then, in private meetings, they discussed and interpreted the various passages, but they excluded from their gatherings all priests and any laymen who disagreed with their exegesis of Scripture. As a result, in 1199, Pope Innocent III issued a letter in which he praised their devotion to Scripture, but condemned their secret exclusive meetings and their anti-clerical attitude. Later, the synods of Toulouse and Tarragona forbade the laity to possess or read translations of the Bible in the vernacular. Interest in the reading and discussion of the Gospel and the preaching of the Crusades for the liberation of holy places naturally contributed to a great deal to another dominant characteristic of medieval piety. Devotion to the Sacred Humanity of Christ Some historians have asserted that this devotion was introduced by St. Bernard and popularized by St. Francis of Assisi, but the truth of the matter is that this devotion had existed in the Church from earliest times. It did not develop in the 12th century, however, because of the whole worldwide interest in the Crusades and the Holy Land, my devotion of the faithful began to focus more and more on various scenes or mysteries of the life of Christ 
on the instruments of his passion and death of Christ. The attention of the faithful was especially fixed on the intensity of Christ's suffering and, indeed, was preoccupied with that aspect. In succeeding centuries, mystics such as St. Bridget described in minute tale the sufferings of Christ. In art, which reflects or animates the devotion of the faithful, the crucifixes were made much more realistic and extenuated the agony of Christ. For example, instead of portraying the two feet nailed separately to the cross, one foot was placed over the other and one nail trans transpires both feet. As a result, the artist or sculptor could portray the more intense suffering of Christ crucified. A treatise on the sacramental confession in the second half of the twelfth century contains a passage in which the author, Peter de Bloy, contrasts to true devotion with pure emotion. There is no merit in any feeling of devotion unless it proceeds from the love of Christ. Many of the characters in tragedies or other poems and songs are wise and illustrious and powerful and excite our, our love. The actors put before us the trials they endured, the injustice they suffered, and the audience is moved to tears. You are touched by these fables. When you hear our Lord spoken of devoutly and are so moved, is that truly the love of God? You have compassion for God and also for Artus. In either case, your tears are in vain if you do not love God, but if your tears of devotion and penitence do not flow from the sources of our Savior, that is, from faith, hope, and love. The name of Jesus was likewise the object of a great veneration in this century, propagated no doubt by the, to a great extent by St. Bernard, as was devotion to the sacred humanity of Christ. During this same period, an English Cistercian composed the tender hymn, Dulcis Jesu Memoria. At the same time, particular feasts in honor of the mysteries of Christ were multiplied. Churches and chapels were increasingly dedicated to some aspect of the life of Christ, and artists produced numerous illustrations of the mysteries of Christ in painting, sculpture, and theatrical protections. Flowing likewise from the devotion to Christ, and the belief that the gospel was the sole rule for Christian living was the imitation of Christ, particularly in regard to poverty. Numa's preachers and writers insist that by the very fact of his baptism, even if he never becomes a monk or cleric, the Christian is obliged to renounce the world and its pomps. So well was the message understood that in the eyes of the laity the worst and most obvious sin of clergy and religious was avarice, often accompanied by lust. At the same time, numerous laymen tried to live literally the injunction of Christ to give up all worldly, worldly possessions and follow him, and they lamented the fact that many bishops priests and monks were psychophants, and the wealthy and interested only in accumulating vast sums of money. Unfortunately, some of the very persons who attempted to live in evangelical poverty in the face of the greed and luxury of ecclesiastics often went to excess in their fervor and ended up in heresy. Wherever the normal pattern of communities in the church persisted, dio dioceses, parishes, monasteries, chapters, confraternities, 
it seems undeniable that orthodoxy was not seriously threatened. On the other hand, whenever the faithful were seeking to escape from it, they were in danger of losing their spiritual balance and ultimately their orthodoxy. People often tended towards a private interpretation of the gospel. This explains why Western Christianity, when confronted by poverty or possibly by the gospel and its ideal of absolute nakedness, presents a complex picture. On the one hand, there were the solid religious organizations. They remained perfectly orthodox. And those of the faithful who did not belong to them were very ready to accuse them of betraying the gospel. On the other hand, there was a swarm of small groups who wished for various reasons to practice the gospel in all its purity, but who easily foundered in heresy. Their spirit was not altogether sound, and they were much in the limelight, as can be seen from references to them in contemporary documents. Also closely linked to the imitation of Christ was an increasing devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Until the 8th century, Christians firmly believed that the Mass was a continuation of the Last Supper and that Christ was truly present on the altar. But then theologians such as Pachesis, Radbertus, Eregina, Ratram, Rantramnus of Corby, and Flor Florus of Lyons began to discuss the Eucharistic in order to increase the fervor of the faithful. Eventually, the theologizing of the Eucharist led to controversy, in the midst of which Beringer of Tours denied the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. The expression transubstantiation seems to have been introduced into the theologically theology of the Eucharist at this time, perhaps by Bishop Hildebert of Tours. After a prolonged polemic, the Fourth Lateran Council officially settled the controversy and made practical regulations concerning the Mass and Communion. During this period, a number of changes were introduced regarding the Eucharist. One of the most notable was the elevation of the host after the consecration of the Mass. It was only later that the chalice was also elevated, but still covered with the pall. Very quickly, however, the authentic veneration of the real presence of Christ was mixed with practices that were almost superstitious. The canon of the Mass was still a period of silence, recollection, and mystery in order to foster the great possible reverence. The reception of communion was, infrequ was infrequent in spite of the great devotion of the people. As a result, the Fourth Lateran Council commanded that Catholics must receive communion at least once a year during the Easter season. One of the reasons why the people received communion so seldom was their extreme respect for the Eucharist. They felt obliged to go to confession before communion even when there was no need to do so. Thus, confessions of, of devotion became more and more common. The reserva reservation of the Eucharist in the tabernacle became standard practice, and in 1246, the first diocesan feast in honor of Corpus Christi was celebrated. Later it was extended and ultimately made a universal feast by Pope Urban IV. The Pope had hesitated about the promulgation until the clergy and the faithful of Orvieto 
brought to him in solemn procession a corporal that was stained red with the precious blood that had flowed from the consecrated host. This was July 19th, 1264. Together with devotion to Christ and a veneration of the Blessed Sacrament, the faithful of this period had a filial love for Mary and a veneration for the saints and angels. Marian devotion was promulgated particularly in the monasteries. The, the Cistercians were called Brothers of Holy Mary. In feudal times, the title of Our Lady, Notre Dame, Madonna, was natural. Known prayers and hymns in the 12th century were Salve Regina, Ave Maristar Stella, Alma Redemptoris, and, of course, the Ave Maria. However, at this time the Ave Maria consists only in the Archangel's salutation. The name Jesus was added in the 15th century. There was also a practice of reciting 50 or even 150 Ave Marias, but the roses, rosary as we know it did not come along until popular use until later. The Angelus was recited only at the ringing of the bell in the evening. As regards the saints, the various guilds placed themselves under saintly protectors and a saint's name was bestowed on a child at baptism. Following upon this devotion was the preservation of saints' relics and the construction of special shrines for their burial. James of Voragine composed the famous book The Golden Legend lives in Lives of the Saints and did James de Vitri, Caesarius, and Thomas of Contemporary. It should be noted, however, that the beginning of the veneration of the saints was popular action. Many of the ancient saints have never been officially recognized as such by the Holy See. In order to correct abuses, Pope Alexander II reserved this prerogative of canonization to the Holy See, as have, has been purged by Pope Gregory the Ninth in 1234. The Fourth Lateran Council insisted that all relics must be authenticated by the Holy See. Military Orders St. Bernard not only preached the Second Crusade in the name of Pope Eugene III in 1145, but he, he was also closely related to the emergence of a new religious institute in the Church, that of the Soldier Monk. In feudal Christianity there had always been a military concept of the members of the Kingdom of God, the Church, whose ruler was Christ the King, but now St. Bernard greeted, greets with enthusiasm a new kind of militia that comes forth in the Holy Land and has its object to expel the Muslims from holy places. The first of the military orders, the Knights Templar, was founded in the precincts of the Temple at Jerusalem around 1118 and was to some extent affiliated with the canons of the Holy Sepulchre. Its mission was to defend Christians in the city of Jerusalem, even by force of arms. The Knights Templar observed poverty, chastity, and obedience, and therefore they were recognized as religious. Their rule was based on that of the canons regular, the rule of St. Benedict, and Cistercian observances. Consequently, they assisted at the divine office, and were obliged to fast and abstinence. 
and they were to dress simply in conformity with their military life. At the same time, the Knights of Malta were also founded in Jerusalem, and, like the Templars, they were attracted or attached in some way to the canons regular, although their mission was to care for the hospital of St. John the Baptist. They followed the rule of St. Augustine, and members were drawn from clerics and laymen. They observed the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and lived in community. In a short time these two groups spread throughout Europe and were especially effective in helping to reconquer Spain from the Moors. In Spain another group was formed, known as the Knights of Santiago de Compostela, although they were not religious and therefore did not have to observe the three evangelical councils. Their whole purpose was to defend the church and expel the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula. Other organizations affiliated to Cistercian monasteries in Spain were the orders of Calatrava, Alcantara, and Avis. The problem arises of how to reconcile Christians indeed men vowed to the evangelical councils, with dedication to war and the necessary killing of the enemy. Yet even St. Bernard insisted that when they are fighting for the Lord, they are to fear neither the danger of being killed, nor the sin of killing an enemy. Yet the crusaders were never considered martyrs, for there were, as St. Peter the Hermit told them, monks in regard their virtues, but soldiers in their actions. Saint Norbert and Primantre Although the canons regular did not exert any notable influence in the life of the church until the 12th century, the origins of canonical life can be traced back to Saint Augustine. Thus, in a letter addressed to a community of canons in Bavaria, Pope Urban II wrote, We give thanks to God that you have resolved to renew among yourselves the admir admirable life of the Holy Fathers of the Church. This is the way of life which was instituted by Pope Urban the Martyr, which Augustine organized by his rules which Jerome molded by his letters, which Gregory commissioned Augustine, the bishop of the English, to institute. Although, as Vicaire points out, the origin of canons is a cloudy part of history, there is no doubt that Pope Urban II considered the life of the canons to be as authentically rooted in primitive Christianity as was the monastic life. Bishop Eusebius of Vercelli and St. Augustine introduced the common life among their clergy, and in 535 the Council of Claremont defined canons as priests or deacons assigned to a church. Bishop Schrodegang of Metz drew up a rule for his clergy which was based on the rule of St. Benedict and the Synod at Aix la Chapelle, promulgated the new Regula Canonicorum, requiring common life and obedience to a superior but allowing possession of goods. Nevertheless, the canons regularly, as we know them today, did not come into existence until the second half of the 11th century. At that time the rule of St. Augustine became the basis for the life of the canons regular, and they themselves were recognized as religious, but distinct from the monks. The diocesan priest canons continued 
to exist, but they abandon community life and retain the function of chanting the divine office in the cathedral. In 1059, the Synod of Rome op imposed the common life on all clerics who were ordained to a specific church or cathedral. And during the 11th century, many cathedral chapters and collegiate chapters adopted the rule of St. Augustine. The canons who did so became canonici regulares instead of canonici seculares, diocesan priest canons. Because they also pronounced the religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, while some chapters remain autonomous, others in due time federated into congregations. From the beginning, the Vita Canonica offered diocesan priests who are ordained for the ministry the opportunity to live a community life in poverty. The first question that comes to mind is why diocesan priests should be con encouraged to embrace this form of life. In the mind of St. Augustine, the reason was for the attainment of the perfection of charity, since he states early in his rule, you should wish to live in your house in unanimity, having only one heart and one soul in God, since it is for you this that you have come together. Between the ninth and eleventh centuries, the Vita Canonica was proposed and then imposed on diocesan priests as means of reform to protect them against avarice and lust. The Synod of Rome in 1059 proposed the Vita Canonica, a common life in poverty, as a means to return to the apostolic life of the prim primitive Christians. Thus, St. Peter Damon stated, It is indeed clear and evident that the rule of the canons is modeled on the norms of the life of the apostles, and that any community which keeps its discipline with exactitude imitates the tender infancy of the church still at the breast. It is readily understandable how the emphasis on the monastic aspects of the canonical life led to the emergence of the canons regular, a new form of religious life, in which the ministry of souls, not generally the work of monks, became one of the purposes of religious life in a non-contemplative religious institutes. The principal distinction between the canons regular and the monks is that the former dedicate themselves to the apostolate. Anselm of Havelberg, in his apologetic epistle, shows that the active life and the contemplative life, later referred to as the mixed life, so it can be perfectly blended with the life of the canons, Vicaire points out several aspects of the development which were of special importance in the theology of spiritual humanity. The apostolic ideal is thus clearly recalled to the ministry. Once again, the new orientation results from the needs of the times. The Gregorian movement which was an effort to reform the church by the reform of the clergy, was at the same time the inception of a reformation designed to encompass the whole of Christian society. Putting an end to the equation between perfection and the flight of the world, it sought, on the contrary, to situate this Christian perfection, especially for the clergy, in a return to the world for the purpose of conquering it in order to Christianize it. The Gregorian movement very explicitly sought to call all Christians to the life of sanctity while holding their proper places.
This courageous and original movement affected Christianity by making clear that holiness did not belong only to a small elite which consecrated itself to the life of perfection by fleeing from the world, but that it belongs to all these, whatever their work may be, who bear the name of Christian and live well in the role in society that belongs to them. This evolution reacted on the ideal of the Vita Apostolica, which was no longer ordered only to developing virtue in the clergy and to freeing them from temporal ambitions by poverty, but at the same time to prepare them for the ministry in Christianity as formerly it had prepared the apostles for their ministry of evangelization. It would not be accurate, however, to conclude that after this the emergence of the canons regular as religious institutes, dedication to the ministry and to the care of souls, superseded in every case the monastic elements of the Vita Canonica. Rather, as Rimbaud of Liege states, there are two types of canons regular, those who were in contact with the people and those who were more separated from the world. Our purpose, it will suffice to show the effects of this divergence in the two most famous canonical orders, the Premonstrations and the Victorines. St. Norbert was originally a Canonicus Secularis of the Diocese of Cologne, and in 1115 he retired into solitude to lead a life of prayer and austerity. Shortly thereafter he became a hermit preacher and traveled from place to place, denouncing the laxity of morals among the clergy and the laity at the request of the Bishop of Laon, Norbert gathered a group of priests and laity at Premontre, where they dedicated themselves to a life of prayer, austerity, and manual labor. Preaching was not abandoned, but it was not the primary purpose of the foundation. Named Archbishop of Magdeburg in 1126, Norbert assigned his followers the task of reforming the diocese and doing mission work in northern Germany. Norbert died on 1134, but even before his death the premonstration communities in France and England tended towards a more contemplative type of life, although they never abandoned the idea of St. Norbert which was to combine the life of the cloister with the clerical ministry. By 1134 the apostolate was, for all practical purposes, dropped from the statutes of the premonstrations, and they proposed as a goal the attainment of priestly holiness by monastic asceticism. Perhaps the most outstanding figure of the monastic and contemplative elements in premonstrationism it was Adam of Dryburg, who transferred to the Carthusians in 1189. Attempting as he did to establish a religious order that would combine the monastic observances with the priestly ministry, St. Norbert was a forerunner of the mendicant orders of the 13th century. This is especially true as regards the Norbertine orientation to the apostolate and the strict observance of poverty bordering on in indigenous. Nevertheless, as regards the religious exercises and the mo mode of life within the abbeys, the Normatines preserved a more monastic milieu than did the medicants. Insistence on solitude within the framework of community life, daily recitation of the office of the Blessed Virgin, in addition to the divine office, alternation of liturg liturgical prayer with Lectio Divina,
and private mental prayer and dedication to manual or intellectual labor. The rule of St. Augustine was followed as liter literally as possible, but the statutes of Primontre, which greatly resemble those of the Cistercians, gave the Premonstratians rather more of a Benedictine monasticism than Augusti Augustinian Vita Canonica. But eventually the Premonstratians balanced the tip in favor of the apostolate and priestly ministry. With regard to the life of the cloister, there was no great difference between the life of the Premonstratensens and that of the monks. They were the same emphasis on charity in the common life, same austerities, same love of that heavenly life of which the life of the cloister is an anticipation. The conception of prayer in which the celebration of the liturgy alternated with Lectio Divina, meditation and pure prayer, the same guarded attitude towards too intellectual a knowledge, a knowledge to which is to be preferred an understanding brought about by love, a uh, tasting and experience, and finally the same devotion to the Mother of God, and the same bringing of the new sensibility of fear on the contemplation of the mysteries of our salvation. The originality of this order lies, therefore, beneath the balance between the spirituality of the cloister and the cura animarum. In its early days the latter was not as prominent everywhere, but it was always an essential part of the ideal of Premontre, and gradually became more explicit. In their pastoral trend, as in giving it the first place to poverty, premonstrations were a foreshadowing of the mendicant orders of the 13th century. They showed that the crisis in monasticism had borne fruit in that they had encouraged the appearance in the church of more and differing states of life. It was not only that they were various ways of fulfilling the ideal of the gospel, now the difference were recognized and justified on doctrinal grounds, a uh, twofold progress. The Canons of St. Victor With the Canons of St. Victor, the trend was in a different direction from that of the Premon, Premon Stratensens. Although they remained in a monastic tradition and followed the rule of St. Augustine, the Victorines concentrated their efforts to a large extent on intellectual pursuits, thus contributing to the development of scholasticism. All of this had its beginning with William of Champeaux, professor at the School of Notre Dame in Paris, who in 1108 retired to a hermitage near Paris with some disciples after a controversy with his student Abelard. In 1113, the group adopted the rule of St. Augustine, and soon the monastery of St. Victor became an outstanding theologian center and enjoyed tremendous growth as a congregation of canons regular. William was named Bishop of chalon sur marne and such as such he consecrated St. Bernard Abbot in 1121. Following the practico-speculative -spec method of St. Augustine, the school of St. Victor gained great renown, especially though its two greatest luminaries, Hugh of St. Victor and Richard of St. Victor. They were other authors, but they also deserve at least a brief mention. 
Following the practico-speculative method of St. Augustine, the school of St. Victor gained great renown, especially through its greatest luminaries, Hugh of St. Victor and Richard of St. Victor. There were other authors also, but and they deserve at least a brief mention. Adam of St. Victor, who died in 1192, is the poet of the school and author of liturgical sequences. Achard, died in 1171, wrote treatises on the Trinity and Christology. Walter, 1180, composed sermons on Jesus and Mary. God Godfrey, 1194, left a humistic work called Fons Philosophiae, written in poetic form, and Thomas of St. Victor, known as Thomas Gallus, later the founder and abbot of, of the monastery of St. Andrew at Vercelli. And, most important, a commentary and synthesis of the works of the Pseudo-Dionysius, Thomas had a strong influence on the early Franciscans. Alexander of Hales, St. Bonaventure, Adam of Morisco, and was a personal friend of St. Anthony of Padua. He is credited with promoting a trend towards Dionysian spirituality as opposed to speculative spiritual theology. Hugh of St. Victor, 1097-1141, to has been called Alter Augustinus, and Villoslada does not hesitate to call him the most outstanding theologian of the entire 12th century. He is acclaimed by Bill Meyer as the most brilliant theologian of the 12th century, and Grabmans says that Hugh comp composed the first complete synthesis of dogmatic theology in the period of high scholasticism. His deep and lengthy study of the works of St. Augustine enabled him to present an Augustinian synthesis that had never before been accomplished. Hugh's major work is On the Sacraments of the Christian Faith, which was on an introduction to the understanding of Scripture. It could more properly be entitled On the Mysteries of the Christian Faith because Hugh used the word sacrament to designate all the holy things treated in Scripture. In the dialogue on the sacraments of the natural law and the written law, he attempted to provide a summary of the Christian faith. His teaching on the spiritual life is found in his treatises on meditation, on the method of prayer, in praise of charity, on the formation of novices, in his commentary on the celestial hierarchy the, of the Pseudo-Dionysius and his homilies on Ecclesiastes, another work, De Contemplioni et Ejus Specibus, is attributed to Hugh, but not with certitude. According to Hugh, although original sin has left its disastrous effects, even in sinful state man still retains a memory of God. This serves as a point of departure so the man can return to God, and the path of his return is knowledge and virtue. The spiritual life, therefore, is at once speculative and practical and its perfection bestows that wisdom which is the unifying principle of spiritual life. The three stages of the spiritual life on a speculative level are symbolic knowledge, rational knowledge, and mystical knowledge. As August Augustine had said, the whole world is a book, but it does not suffice to admire the letters, one must be able to read. Or, following Plato, the world is a mirror in which we are reflected in divine ideas. 
and this constitutes a symbolical symbolic knowledge one that finds for example in scripture as to the rational knowledge one ascends to the invisible by means of the visible and this calls for reflection or meditation departing from an awareness of his dis dissimilarity to god man can attain to the divine likeness but this reflection must not be pure speculation it must be an understanding an intus legere that stimulates effective love and leads at last to contemplation which is mystical knowledge thus faithful to the method of the fathers and to the monastic tradition Hugh sees theology as a practico speculative science that uses both reason and faith to lead one to mysticism